This is Daniel Gabriel speaking from the big picture. I'm here in Yerevan, Armenia. We're here at the Global Forum against the crime of genocide, 22nd to the 24th of April. We've been interviewing quite a few people inside, a lot of the professors, ministers, other parliamentarians about the genocide issue against the Armenians, the Greeks and the Aramean Syriacs. As you can see, quite a few people here at the forum. Uh, there's a lot of ministers here, a lot of politicians and other scholars, professors, historians. It's been a great event by the Armenians and Yerevan is an absolute magical place, uh, really an inspiration to the Aramean people. So chat to you soon. I think uh, we should speak about genocide uh, because it's not the uh, only particular part of history of Armenia, of Poland, uh, of uh, Rwanda uh, and other countries uh, of Jews, for example, Holocaust, but it's the mm, part of world history. Uh, and uh, if we uh, want uh, really fight uh, with uh, potential genocide in the future, uh, we should uh, speak about it, organize this conference, uh, and uh, remember about uh, this strategy. Can I ask you, just uh, yesterday Austria recognized the genocide and tomorrow Germany may do the same. Uh, what are your thoughts about how far the European governments can go on this and do you recommend that they do the same? Well, uh, I think uh, it was uh, a very good uh, step, political step, in very good uh, direction. Uh, I, I would like to inform you that the uh, Polish Parliament uh, in 2005, 10 years ago, uh, for 90th anniversary of uh, Armenian genocide, uh, made the very concrete resolution uh, condemned uh, the, the Armenian genocide. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, uh, obviously, I know I'm a politician, that is the uh, steps uh, are uh, skeptical to Turkey, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, we should uh, remember and we should uh, speak about the history, uh, about the uh, conclusions for the future. Uh, and uh, I am proud that the European Parliament uh, also uh, this month, uh, April, uh, uh, approved the very good resolution about uh, this uh, problem. It was third time in the history of the European Parliament because first time was in uh, 1986, the second time uh, during the 90s. Uh, and now uh, I think it's a very uh, good uh, and very clear uh, position. And uh, if national parliaments uh, uh, will uh, go follow European Parliament, it will be good. And today, of course, we're, we're looking at Iraq and Syria where genocide of the Aramean Syriacs, for example, and other Christian groups is taking place before our very eyes. What is your view on that and how can, you, how can the European Parliament act in order to halt that activity? It's, a, I think, a fundamental question and fundamental challenge for us. Uh, uh, the silence is the uh, worst answer for this new genocide. In my speech today, uh, I uh, spoke about uh, this fact that uh, uh, every day our uh, sisters and brothers in Christianity uh, died, uh, and uh, we speak. We should speak about uh, very loudly, but also not only speak, uh, but uh, we can organize very concrete help, not only humanitarian help, 
but uh, political and maybe, maybe uh, military. Like many scholars these days, I tend to think about the, the genocide uh, of, of the Ottoman Christians in the context of the breakdown of the, the collapse or decline of the Ottoman Empire and its terminal moments during the First World War. I'm also interested in the, in the wider question of ethnic violence and ethno-religious violence in, uh, at that time or around that time in previous generations and in subsequent generations too, and thinking about some of the connections between violence against Muslims and the decline of the Ottoman Empire as, um, as we see sort of ethnic cleansing from the new Balkan states that emerge out of the Ottoman Empire and um, deportations and expulsions of Muslims from the Caucasus, and then that progressing from the uh, victimization of Muslims to the victimization of Christians in the Ottoman Empire during the First World War. And it, partly it's a sort of chain reaction actually, as, as, uh, as, as innocent Christians in eastern Anatolia uh, and indeed throughout Anatolia uh, are, are the victims of an increasingly anti-Christian, uh, partly nationalist but partly is Islamist or is Islamic oriented, still Islamic oriented Committee of Union and Progress regime that, that wants effectively ethnic homogeneity uh, and wants to remove certainly Christian populations by the time of the First World War. Uh, and I see that very much as being influenced by the longer term demographic change of the empire too. But this crisis moment of the First World War itself is when the most violent tendencies of the governing re regime are unleashed upon, upon the Christians of, of, of Anatolia. And uh, let me ask you today about the genocide that we're seeing today during in Syria and Iraq and the Christian community continue to face this type of uh, persecution. What are your thoughts about the learnings of the past and how they're being applied today? Because it seems to be a repeat of history. It's, it's, a, hideous, it's a hideous repetition, isn't it? I'm, for us to be here in, in 2015 talking about events that are ongoing with some of the same groups becoming victim, um, not, not the same ideologies here, you know, this is much more pronouncedly Isla Islamist that uh, doesn't have the element of, of nationalism, of course, that, that, that was there and present, and there's not the state-centric organization of some of this, but clearly genocidal massacres are, are taking place against a number of communities, you know, Syriac and, and, and you know, Yazidi. Uh, these are hor horrendous events that, you know, of course, the West itself partly paved the way for with its shockingly miscalculated invasion of Iraq. And you're here at the Global Forum. What are your thoughts about the Global Forum itself and how a lot of historians and scholars and ministers are together to talk about the issue of genocide and recognition? And also you've heard about reparation, which has been a key message during the conference. Well, it's a very important gathering. Uh, it is good to see politicians and scholars together. It's good to see statements of commitment on these issues. Uh, obviously, it always remains to be seen how how they will be, you know, how far they will be followed through in, in, in reality. The question of reparations is a big one attendant on perhaps the question of recognition. Uh, I, I mean, in some ways, it should be conceptually separated to my mind, but there are obviously, there are obviously connections there too. I mean, it's another big step down the road. Um, big questions of historical justice there, but also the complexity of issues of compensation at this level, at this, at this distance. But they're very important questions that need to be grappled, and it's good to see that these are being addressed in a sort of systematic public way. What was your key message to the forum? مشاركتنا ورسالتنا من خلال لقاء ومنتدى المنعقد في يريفان بمناسبة الذكرى المئوية لمجازر الإبادة البشرية التي ارتكبت على يد السلطنة العثمانية. هي رسالة لكل العالم أننا ضد الإرهاب وضد أي جريمة مهما كان مرتكبها ومهما مضى من الزمن عليها إلا أن الإنسان لا بد أن يتذكر هذه الجريمة ولا بد أن يدينها وأن ينكرها وأن يمنع تكرار مثل هذه الجريمة. What is your message to the Christian people, the Christian Syriani, Syriac Aramean people within Syria, uh, and also the others that have ancestors and family in Syria? Uh, سوريا وجميع مكوناتها هي متساوية بالحقوق والواجبات. فالمواطنون المسيحيون على اختلاف طوائفهم سواء كانوا سريان أم كاثوليك أم بروستانت أم أرمن هم جميعا موضع 
احترام وتقدير وهم مكون رئيسي من مكونات الشعب السوري سوريا صمدت لأنها تحوي هذه المكونات الرائعة من الشعب السوري سوريا تريد من خلال مشاركتها أن توصل رسالة للعالم أن سوريا ضد الإرهاب ومع محاربة الإرهاب ومع محاربة الفكر التكفيري الوهابي الذي أتانا من السعودية والمدعوم من السعودية وقطر وتركيا It was a, a general problem against the Christian communities of Turkey because before the First World War uh, at least a, a quarter of population of the Turkey was Christian and Christians were not accepted uh, suitable for uh, planning national Turkish state. So it was a part of social engineering, uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, massacres, and uh, assimilation. And yet the Turkish government still refuses to acknowledge the genocide. What are your thoughts about that? And um, what are you doing with respect to allowing Turkish people to learn more about the facts on the ground? Tradi uh, traditional uh, uh, state policy. Now, a uh, genocide issue in Turkey is a national security issue. So it is uh, accepted a threat uh, against the Turkey. But I am against this because it is not tra a threat uh, uh, against the Turkey. Uh, the acknowledgement of the truth and apology uh, uh, will help also Turkish citizens for a more secure uh, future uh, for their existence because uh, other different groups uh, were suffered uh, all the history of the Turkish Republic because of their belief, because of their political views or because of their ethnic origin. Um, you've also been arrested quite a few times in Turkey as well. Do you want to tell the people about that? Oh, I was arrested uh, always because of uh, our, my activities uh, for freedom of expression. Last time I was ex arrested 2011 because I was very active about the situation of the arrested journalists and the writers and I was also a genocide uh, researcher. I published books and I published articles. This was also a reason to be arrested. But because of the international solidarity campaigns, I was released uh, after five months. And what do you think of the Global Forum Against uh, Crime of Genocide here in Yerevan? What are your thoughts about this event and events like it? Um, Global Forum is a, a great chance uh, to the people uh, collect and uh, talk about the truth and uh, exchange their exper experiences. To prevent uh, new genocides, we must have a global consciousness uh, against the genocide and uh, we must create a consciousness and also we must say never again. This never again consciousness is very important not only the victimized groups for all the world. We think it's very important to educate new generations about the crime of genocide and why perpetrators commit the crime of genocide and how to deter genocides from happening in the future. And a very important part of that process is accountability for past genocides and not only apologies to those who are the descendants of the survivors of genocide, but also taking historical responsibility for what happened, as the government of West Germany did in the years after the Holocaust, and today the government of modern Germany does. Uh, in a way, Germany is the model for countries and nations that have committed genocide, uh, but very few nations have followed that model. Uh, Germany is really quite rare in that respect, and it, I think, is very important that the government of Turkey should accept its historical responsibilities and shoulder them 
and recognize the breadth of the mass murders that were planned and implemented by the agents of the state, ranging from the military to the police to militias, etc. Uh, yesterday, Johnny Messor, who is the president of the WCA, spoke about the Syriac people and the elimination of the Syriac Arameans today. Yeah. And you responded to that as well. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yes. Uh, I frankly uh, never believed that I would live to see a time when uh, peoples in countries like Iraq, uh, Syria, etc., uh, who are descendants of very ancient communities and are not Muslims, uh, would face annihilation again. Uh, I thought those days were past. Uh, I did not anticipate the rise of people who claim that they want to create an Islamic state. And I never believed that anyone who was committed to a religion like Islam would distort the principles of that religion and take from it uh, this uh, extreme uh, and exaggerated version of Islam which respects no one except those who are in the good graces of a handful of people at the top uh, who claim to be able to interpret all the holy books of the great religions of the world. You know, Turkey uh, is not the Turkey of before. I mean, the, uh, both at the level of the society and the state, things are changing regarding the past. And this past, of course, includes the Armenian genocide. So, uh, and uh, Turkish society is well ahead of it, of, it, of course. And, uh, you know, people are uh, reconsidering the, uh, the past uh, on how uh, this, uh, the Turkish nation state was created, uh, how the religious slash ethnic uh, cleansing took place, uh, starting end of 19th century, continuing through the 20th century. And uh, this is, you know, a soul searching for the Turkish society also. It's very important. It's, it's healing, it's, it's a healing process. And this is, uh, it's, it's good for Turkey, it's good for uh, Armenia, it's go good for Armenians. And this is, in my opinion, the most important development and dynamic that is taking place since years in Turkey. And yet the Turkish government still refuses to acknowledge the genocide of the Armenians, the Syrianis, the Syriacs and the Greeks. What are your thoughts about the future position of the Turkish government? Exactly. I mean, I don't comment on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the wills and wishes and the positions of the Turkish government uh, on this issue. They do what they want. But I mean, what I see is that they, uh, this, this government, this very government of AK party, has also ha they have also changed you know when it comes to the genocide so it's uh, of course they don't use the word but that you know there were there was uh, a decree a governmental decree some years ago to forbid the use of the uh, the prefix you know because every time a government official was talking about the genocide in turkey he or she was using the prefix so-called no the decree was saying don't use so-called anymore and this is even this is a, a you know uh, a step of course this step is not enough for armenians you know to who are looking for justice for 100 years but this is how it is unfortunately and uh, it will take time but uh, the genies are out of the battle and i don't think that they will get back in ever you know this is well, I was talking about the history of the development of the legal concept of genocide and of crimes against humanity, uh, how they've been interpreted uh, over the years, uh, how the concept of crime against humanity has become more robust because it applies in peacetime now, and how the crime of genocide is really the crime of crimes. It's at the, at the top of the pyramid, if you want, of, of international crimes. And then I addressed the question of the the retroactive application of these notions because they were only defined in the 1940s really 
although the expression crime against humanity exists from 1915 in law, in international relations, and it, it exists in, in uh, literature, in, in political writing for centuries before that. Um, and so it's my belief that uh, it's perfectly appropriate to speak both about crimes against humanity and about genocide when we're talking about the period of the First World War, and in particular, the massacres of the Armenians and the Syriacs and the Greeks in, uh, in, uh, during the war. And uh, during your discussion, you were talking about, of course, as you just mentioned, the retrospective application of the terminology of genocide. What's your conclusion about that, and do you feel that we can still apply the terminology of genocide retrospectively? Uh, we certainly can apply it. Uh, obviously, we're talking first and foremost about crimes, and crimes involve, first and foremost, individual accountability. There's nobody left alive now from that time whom we could hold individually accountable. So in that sense, it's really more of a, of a it's, it's a, the use of the language rather than any practical consequence in court. Uh, of course, we can also accuse states of crimes, and I don't think there's any difficulty legally with talking about crimes of Turkey. That was the language that was used in the declaration by the uh, British, the French, and the Russians in 1915, crimes of Turkey, which would be crimes against humanity and genocide that were, that were perpetrated then. Hi, it's Daniel Gabriel speaking from the big picture. I'm here in beautiful Yerevan, Armenia. I'm here actually speaking to Arman Akopian, uh, who is a diplomat and a scholar here in Armenia. Um, Arman, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to talk to you because uh, you have just, of course, uh, written this book here, which I'll show to the, if I can get this around here like this. Uh, this is your most recent publication, which I'll ask you about in a moment. And of course, you also have uh, this book here um, as well, which I have upside down. Um, this book here is used in your course, as I understand, because you're also a lecturer at the university um, on Syriac Aramaic, um, where you also teach Syriac. So let me ask you, can you just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your scholarly work? Uh, you don't have to talk too much about your diplomatic work. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, program. Uh, well, uh, here at Yerevan University, we have a course in Syriac studies, which consists of two parts. One part is a course in uh, classical Syriac, and this is the manual which we use, as you uh, already uh, mentioned, uh, classical Syriac in the Armenian language, uh, which I've uh, written uh, in already 10 years, from 2005. And in fact, we first introduced classical Syriac to the Yerevan University in 2005. And the second book, which was published just uh, two, two weeks ago, it's an introduction to Aramaic and Syriac studies. And it presents the history, the culture, and the civilization of uh, uh, Aramaic Syriac people from the beginning of times and up to our days. So I've tried to include as much information as possible about the Aramaic Syriac uh, people in this book. Well, it's a comprehensive uh, piece of work, actually. Um, it's a fantastic book, and I think that uh, the WCA, the World Council of Aramean Syriacs, is looking at translating the book into English. Um, for all the people at home, it's actually an amazing book. Uh, you can learn everything here about our people um, if you have a few weeks to read this. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, because there's so much here, actually, about the Aramean history and the Aramaic language. I'm, I'm really interested in the connection between the Armenians and the Arameans, um, because of course, there's not only the the uh, script, there's also the Christianity part of it. Because Christian, uh, the Armenians became Christians in 301 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the Aramean history, which dates back before that as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about the connection between the Armenians and the Arameans? Yes, you're very right that the connections between Armenian and uh, Aramean people is very uh, very ancient and very strong. And uh, these two peoples have always been living side by side and even inside of each other, if we can uh, say like that. And uh, uh, especially after the adoption of Christianity by both peoples, this connection became very strong. Mm. And there was a very strong mutual 
influence and Armenians were very much influenced by the Syriacs and um, a very big portion of the Syriac classical literature has been translated into Armenian and in fact very many pieces of uh, Syriac literature they survive only in Armenian translation mm. you know, like many pieces by Ephraim the Syrian, Marafrem they survive only in Armenian translations and many ecclesiastical works as well so this connection has been very strong and uh, also um, let mention that when the Armenian alphabet was created at the beginning of the fourth century a part of the process took place in Edessa in the Syriac Armenian milieu if you can say so and uh, because of the that rich culture and that, that rich literary translation that existed in that city with its rich archives and uh, libraries so it was a perfect place for the Armenian scholars who were involved in the creation of the alphabet to spend time in Edessa and I also we can very safely assume that we're in very close contact with Syriacs in the process of creation of the alphabet. Uh, it's, amaz it's an amazing connection between our people and also the Armenians. Uh, some of the other things that you also speak about in your book is about the terminology of Asuri, uh, which is uh, as we would know it, as the Arameans would know it, is the direct translation to the Arameans or the Syrian Christians. Uh, what is your perception of that that definition of Asuri and how often is it? It's used here in Armenia, just to be clear. It's used here in Armenia uh, to describe a certain, class, a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. And who, who are those people? Well, here in Armenia we call the Asuri the the followers of the uh, Church of the East, or so-called Nestorian um, Syriacs, or Assyrians as they call themselves. Um, uh, this uh, community originates in the first quarter of the 19th century, uh, when Armenia became part of the Russian Empire, and the uh, Christians of living in Iran, in the Urmia region, they were allowed to resettle in Armenia, and this is when uh, several villages were um, established in Armenia around Yerevan and uh, these villages still exist and this is, these are the villages when we actually can hear the uh, modern Aramaic dialect or the even the standard Aramaic dialect and Armenia was one of the very few countries in the world in which the, uh, this language was included in the school curricula and Armenia has the longest uninterrupted history of teaching of this language uh, in the schools. So if you go to this school, to the villages like the Dvina Sori village, uh, you can visit the school and see the uh, children learning uh, their language and they learn it during all their you know, time at school, a full 12 years uh, curriculum, which is a unique experience here in Armenia in teaching modern Aramaic uh, language or modern Assyrian as they call it sometimes. But the, the term, uh, because of course we've just been here in Armenia at the Global Forum uh, for the Crime Against Genocide, and during the whole conference basically there was a reference to the Aramean genocide, that Syriac genocide, as being an Assyrian. We kept on referring to Assyrianism, Assyrian, Assyrian, Assyrian. Um, now, I'm, there seems to be a confusion of terminology, doesn't there, because Asuri does not mean Assyrian. Uh, well, in the Armenian languages, there is uh, there is very uh, s established terminology which goes back to at least fifth century, and uh, in the Armenian historians, in medieval historians and modern historians, they're very clearly distinguished between Asori and Asoristansi. Asori being the Armenian equivalent of the classical Syriac term Suriaya, which was adopted after the Armenians. You know the s history; they adopted Christianity, and since the name Aramean became equivalent to pagan, so they switched to Suriaya. And in Armenian tradition, the Asori was the equivalent of Suriaya. When we read our uh, medieval historians like Moses of Koran, uh, it becomes very obvious for that for him existed two separate peoples, Syriacs, whom we call uh, Asori, and ancient Assyrians were called Asorestansi. And this is the tradition that exists in Armenian um, uh, science, historical science up to these days, if you take the Armenian Encyclopedia and you read the article about the Asoris, the first line that says it says the Asoris are the descendants of Arameans. Or if you read, for example, we have a very interesting book 
on Armenian-Syria cultural exchanges by um, uh, Hayek Melkonian, a very famous historian, a very famous book. He says the same thing, that Azores are part of the Armenian people. So in Armenia, in Armenian terminology, there is no confusion. Of course, other people in the streets may confuse the story with the Soros plants because sound alike. Uh, but that's, this distinction uh, exists in our, uh, our his, in historiography. Uh, and, you know, I think that the former president of um, Armenia was also a historian and also uh, strong, also uh, studied Aramaic yes, history yes. and Syriac Levant history. Petros as well. and he was the first. The president of independent Armenia, a uh, world-renowned scholar in Armenian uh, culture and uh, Armenian-Syria cultural interactions. He has a book and many, many articles. And he also uses the same approach in terminology. Because that's, uh, let me repeat it, it's established in our scientific or histo historic uh, terminology. And, but, there seems to, but there still seems to be some confusion, doesn't there, in the, in the, in the modern society that you refer to. Uh, and something uh, clearly needs to be done because there seems to be a mistaken translation somewhere because what you're saying, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think what you're saying is that all scholars agree and all historians of worth agree that Asuri means Aramean Syriacs. It does not mean Assyrian. But yes, in Armenian tradition, Asori is the equivalent of Suryaya. Yeah. Like the, we call uh, uh, Marafrem Suryaya, it's called uh, Surpi Ephrem Asori or Saint Ephrem, the, uh, the Syriac, if you use the modern uh, version of the world. Okay. Um, and I it's think. No, it's not called um, Surpi Ephrem Asori Stansi. So there is no association in this case with ancient Assyria. And even the us, the Nestorians that live in Armenia today, what terminology do they use? Well, when in Armenian, it's still a sorry, but in other languages and European languages, of course, they use the Assyrian, because that's that's the prevailing terminology among the uh, followers of the Church of the East, connected to the who are the um, connected historically and culturally with Urmia and in, to the lesser extent to Akari region. So but they don't use the terminology author authoraya. The, uh, the Odyssey. They use it. Uh, use it well in, in official or but uh, uh, mostly the term used here in Armenia of, of what I hear all the time, it's Surai. So they call themselves mostly Surai. And Aturai is, you know, it's a, you know that's a more or less artificial uh, mm, a term that was introduced in the uh, 19th century. Sometimes they use it, but for more official uh, texts, let's say that. In ordinary language, it is mostly Suraya. And can I ask you about your book again, just to go back to this, because it's, again, thank you so much for this incredible publication. Um, I, I'm not so sure how many Aramean Syriacs actually read uh, and speak Armenian. Actually, uh, quite a lot. Quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so where can people get this book at the moment? It's going to well, be launched next week. I, yes, I this book is was just printed just uh, 10 or 12 years ago. It's still not in the book bookstores because we'll have the official book launch next you week. Ten, did you say 10 or 12 years ago or 10 or 12 days, days ago? So Sorry, days, <laughs> days, so, uh, days ago, and it will be... The official book launch will be next week, and after that, it will appear in major bookstores. Perfect. Well, let's hope that we get to see the translation in English uh, soon. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Kopi, and I really thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Cheers. Hello, I'm here with His Holiness, um, Patriarch Kafran, uh, a good friend of mine from back in New Jersey days. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for meeting with me here in beautiful Yerevan, uh, Armenia. We've been here at the Global Forum uh, for the Crime Against uh, Genocide uh, meetings here, and you've been here all along as well. Please tell us what your feeling was about the, about the Global Forum and the messages that you've heard over the last few days. We are here at the invitation of the uh, Armenian Apostolic Church to be part of the canonization or declaration of this martyrs of uh, 1915 genocide as saints. And in conjunction with that also 
me to, we took part in one of, in two sessions actually of the global forum, in the uh, plenary session and then in one specific session about the churches against genocide. Yeah. Um, what we found out is that uh, the church and the state worked hand in hand uh, in organizing these events in a way that is very befitting to the memory of the one and a half uh, million Armenians who were killed, who became martyrs and eventually became saints of the church. The uh, form side of it was very important, I believe, because it brought together scholars and uh, politicians from throughout the world who uh, spoke uh, about the understanding, the meaning of genocide and um, the legal implications of the term, what it means to label uh, certain events or certain massacres as genocide. And I find out from the stories I heard that what they were saying was very familiar to our ears, uh, remind us of the stories we used to hear from our grandparents. Mm -hmm. So it all sounded uh, very familiar and uh, it made me more convinced that what we went through also as Syriac people is uh, not, not uh, is, is genocide and nothing less than genocide. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have all right to uh, call it genocide, to demand recognition of it, and to uh, honor the memory of our fallen martyrs, uh, about 500,000 of them. Um, during, this, during these last few days, we've also witnessed, as you had mentioned, the 1.5 million Armenians being consecrated as saints. That was a very moving ceremony that you also attended. What were you feeling during that? Because it was a very emotional experience, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, first of all, it uh, confirmed to me and strengthened my uh, conviction that uh, we are not alone here. Uh, heaven is with us. People who uh, perish here, who, fail, who fall victims, they join the heavenly ranks and they become our intercessors in heaven. And that uh, in itself is a strength for us, for our people. Number two, uh, the canonization or the declaration of the sainthood is a, form, a, a formality that's happening because we know everyone who sheds his or her blood for their faith, they are automatically saints. But the church uh, declares that. Mm -hmm. And because of the uh, 100th anniversary, the centennial, the Armenian church uh, decided to make it more official to declare it in a liturgical as well as um, um, on state level. Yeah. Liturgical way and on state level. They did that, but uh, it uh, brought uh, to us the memory of our fallen uh, martyrs, how they are interceding for us in heaven. The Armenians originally do not have a process of declaring saints like we do not have. All the Orthodox churches do not have a formal process of declaring sainthood of a person. It may be just a, a decree by the Patriarch or a decision of the Holy Synod to recognize, but sainthood is usually recognized by the people. The people become attached to a certain person, a pious person, and that person becomes a saint based on their faith and on, and on that person's um, uh, faith. Uh, so what happens is, uh, Saints are declared saints af after having been treated as saints for many years. In our case, I don't anticipate, I don't see that we are going to have a canonization service, but we may have a declaration also to officially declare our martyrs as saints. We believe they are saints mm -hmm. because they felt they, 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 the the they were martyred for their faith. So they become martyrs, and martyrs are saints in the church. Mm -hmm. We have two kinds of uh, uh, people um, uh, of martyrs, martyrs who eventually died under, uh, uh, under the persecution and were killed, they are become martyrs. And those who were persecuted, who were tortured, but did not uh, die under persecution, they died later natural death, these become what we call uh, confessors. Mm -hmm. So martyrs and confessors, uh, so they uh, Both of them confessed the faith. Uh, one, one group uh, eventually died under, uh, persecution and punishment, the other one well, did not die, died naturally, but both are saints. 
Um, so now, today we also were at the uh, memorial for the April 24 memorial for the 100 years anniversary of the SAFO. And uh, of course, Putin was there, uh, Holland was there. Uh, today, you also met with Putin as well. Do you want to just allow people sure. to know what you, what you spoke about today? Yeah, sure. After, uh, after the uh, service at the memorial, uh, the genocide memorial, we went to the presidential palace for lunch with the presidents who were attending. And uh, I seized the opportunity and I spent a few minutes together with uh, the report of Spetsch of Syria. Uh, we approached Putin and we w wanted to discuss with him the issue of our two beloved archbishops who uh, have been kidnapped for two years now, it's two years and two days yeah. since their uh, abduction. And we wanted to ask for his help and we uh, explained to him the situation and he was very open and he promised to, to help us and uh, we, he asked for us some more details about the case. We promised to send him and we are willing also to go there to Moscow and if needed, if needed to discuss with him in person and to get to try to get any information we can about our two year old archbishops. Um, just on that, uh, as you say, it's been two years and two days. Have you, are you any closer? Um, I'm full of hope. They are alive and they will come back to us. But to be real, we don't have any solid information about their whereabouts or the situation. We hear stories, we hear mm -hmm. reports, mostly very encouraging reports, some discouraging also. But uh, we are still uh, hopeful and confident that uh, they are alive and uh, we are waiting for them, we are praying for them every day and we are doing all that we can. I know so many people are working for on this yes. cause, so many individuals, so many organizations, so many churches, and I would like to thank all those who are working very hard and. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I really uh, believe that our praise and our efforts will bear fruit at the end, and we just want that uh, day to be um, to be close, to be tomorrow, even that they come back to us and uh, we enjoy their presence with us. Allah uh, Akbar. That's true. Uh, yes, inshallah. Um, let me just ask you about the during the sessions. We also heard not only about the Armenian genocide, but we heard about the Greek genocide as well, and also the what was termed the Assyrian genocide. Uh, you know, the WCA has been working on this, and Johnny Messel has been talking about it quite often with government officials here, that the term Assyri in Armenian actually means Syrian Christian rather than, or Syrian Christian as opposed to the term Assyrian. Do you want to talk about that? Because I know you've also had some meetings on this issue. Yes, obviously we welcome any mention of, uh, of the genocide of other peoples other than the Armenians, including the Assyrians. Of course, there were people from the Assyrian Church of the East who also fell uh, victims and from the Chaldeans, and the majority of the Syriacs speaking were from our church, the Syrian Order Church. Now, um, we do have an issue of name with the Armenians. A few weeks ago, the Armenian uh, parliament also mm. recognized the uh, genocide, they call it the Assyrian genocide. And I had the opportunity to talk to the president of Armenia yesterday about this. I thanked him for that. I told him, I know you mean us, the Syriac-speaking Christians, the Syriac Orthodox, Syriac Catholics, the Assyrians and the Chaldeans. He said, yes, of course. I told him, of course, and we welcome that. But however, the, uh, the, the confusion with the name is somehow um, confusing, basically. Uh, the Armenians call us Asori in their language. But when we ask them, what do you mean by a Syria? You mean a Syria? They say, no, we mean you, Syriac Christians, Sy Christians of Syria who have that name, because they have another name for us, for Assyrians. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we try to educate them about that, to tell them uh, the Assyrian church of this is our brothers. We, uh, we love them because they are sister church. We believe uh, originally all of us Syriac speaking people are one. Uh, one race, same race. Uh, Church-wise, we are all the Church of Antioch, the Synod of Church of Antioch, which split uh, over uh, history, and then the Nestorian Church, which later became known as the Assyrian Church of the East, uh, branched. Later, the Chaldean Church from the Nestorian Church also um, was established, and uh, on the other side, uh, on the Western dialect, uh, 
uh, side. The uh, Rome Orthodox or the Greek Orthodox of Syria, of Antioch also, uh, branch out of our uh, one church. From them also the Rome Catholic, Catholic which is the Melkite, not Roman Catholic, Rome Catholic, or Greek Catholic, or Melkites. And then those who remained uh, in the Syrian Church of Antioch, eventually from them also another church was established, which is the Syrian Catholic Church. So all these five churches are the same church. The, the originally was the Church of Antioch, which was uh, mainly Syriac, but also it had some Greek elements in it. Okay. And uh, that is reflected in the branching out of the, of the church. So you explain we are, this to them. You explain this uh, to them. Of they course, accepted. of course. Yeah. Uh, so we are originally the same people. Now, when we uh, when we take the name Assyrian, we know there's the Assyrian Church of the East, and we bundle everybody under that name. We do it injustice to everybody. Mm -hmm. We should. I usually prefer to use the Syriac speaking. If I mean everybody, then Syriac speaking Christians. That includes everybody. Syrian others, Catholic, uh, Assyrian Church of the East, Chaldean. These are all Syriac speaking because. Uh, uh, the, the language is the Syriac Aramaic language. It's not uh, uh, Assyrian, it's not Chaldean. There's no Assyrian and Chaldean, Chaldean languages. Everybody knows that. All historians, all linguists, linguists know that. There's only the, the Syriac Aramaic language. Aramaic is the mother of, of the, uh, this uh, dialects that, uh, uh, that uh, came out of it. Uh, so if you talk about the our people in their different branches, they, they are all Syriac speaking. So I have no right to exclude anybody. They all lost victims, uh, lost, I mean, they gave martyrs uh, during Seifo. So when we speak about Seifo, for me, I speak about the Syriac, speak, the Syriac speaking Christians who, who became martyrs for their faith. Uh, therefore, I expect uh, the this recognition from Armenia and others to include everybody. Mm. Um, so Seifo, uh, Seifo, recognition of Seifo is recognition of the martyrs uh, or the genocide committed against the Syriac speaking Christians who were living in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so we still have a bit of work to do to get that name uh, rectified. And uh, you know, my great grandfather from my mother's side was burnt alive during the genocide and his two brothers also uh, and my father's uh, mother, my grandmother, was also stolen when she was uh, younger and then had to be retrieved. We all have stories like this. Uh, and many of our people who are watching have stories like this. How important is a safe for not only to, to uh, remember uh, today, but also for us to carry with us into the future? Um, in my um, intervention at the uh, forum uh, the other day, I made it clear that SAFO has become part of our identity. Um, all of us, all of us have stories that we heard from, from or about our uh, grandparents, uh, great uncles, um, yeah. and, and others. So uh, it's very important to educate our people about SAFO, it's very important to educate the younger generation about it, to make them aware of what happened to our people. Um, telling the story is the most important thing. We have to tell our story to the people, to our own people and to others also. We have to tell. Our history is a story. SAFO is, is a big chapter of that story. We are neglecting it. We are let me tell you a story. Um, the other day in the masses at the patriarchy, uh, after the liturgy on Sunday, I was sitting with the people, usually I sit with them, they come and they, you know, ask, talk, discuss. One old lady sat next to me, she is in her 80s. And she told me, uh, Your Holiness, I want to thank you. I said, for what? She said, because we are talking about Seifo. I said, what do you mean? I said, because I'm in my 80s and I was never allowed to talk. I know what happened to my mother. She was uh, snatched away. They went and they brought her back mm -hmm. and uh, the story. And, but I was never able to say it. It was always kept in my chest and uh, suffocating me. Now you are allowing us to talk about it. And I said, yes, you are right. That's exactly what's happening. Our wounds are not healed because they are not open. They are not oxygenated. They need some oxygen. They need to open, open up. They need to be, stories need to be told so, so that Wounds are healed, and once we uh, talk about Seifo, once we show respect uh, to, our, to our martyrs and to tell the stories of our forefathers, then we will start the, the process healing, and that's very important for us as a community.
uh, it seems to me that you would encourage all youth, all young people, and even older people, to speak to their parents and get those stories, not lose those stories. Actually, I would encourage the parents to sit with the kids <laughs> and talk to them about it. The kids may not be aware. I tell you uh, an example that I use it also some other time. You know, on Passover day in the Jewish tradition, you know what that happens? They sit over, over uh, around the meal, seder, they call it, seder or seder. And then uh, there's a tradition that the eldest son would ask his father, Dad, why are we sitting differently today? Why is our food different today? What is the story behind this? But then the dad, the father, will start telling him the story of the Exodus. How they were uh, ordered by Moses to get ready to get out of this land of slavery and how God uh, saved them uh, from slavery. That's, the, that's how they tell the story. We have to create, to develop uh, a similar tradition of telling our story from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Uh, young people have to, young people have to uh, know their history yeah. and to be proud of it. And can you also, uh, we're here in Yerevan, in beautiful yeah. Armenia, um, are you inspired by this country because they've come from the ruins of the genocide, they now have their own country, they, they have a very strong nationalism, they also have a very strong religious fervor here as well, um, and they're a strong nation. What is your view on, on that? Um, Inspired? Yes, of course I'm inspired, but I'm also aware that they have always had a country from the beginning. They had a land, called, they called it their own, and they had a country, although that country was also under uh, Soviet occupation and, uh, and, uh, and communist uh, rule for many years, and they were suppressed as Christian nation, but uh, they always uh, kept their uh, patriotism alive. Uh, their faith alive, and we heard that from the patriarch today from the Catholic course, uh, the importance of keeping uh, faith and patriotism uh, alive. I think they uh, uh, they rose uh, above their wounds and their pains, and they started building up themselves as a community, as a nation, as a church. We cannot continue to lament the, the past, to shed tears about the past, but we have to look forward and build on the past and look forward to, to, to take off to, to, to new height. And uh, just my last question to you, yeah. because today we're, we're facing the safe war again, yeah. uh, as you speak you know, mm -hmm. in Syria and Lebanon, and you're witne witnessing it constantly, you're traveling amongst mm -hmm. the people, you're seeing it, uh, WCA, mm -hmm. Johnny's seeing it as well. What's your message to the people about the current genocide, the current extermination of the Christian people across the Middle East today? Um, it's important to uh, be aware of what's happening. Our people, those who are especially in Europe and the States, they have to be aware of what's happening to their brothers and sisters in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. For those who are in the Middle East, we know they are under constant pressure, constant pain and uh, persecution, but it's important to remain uh, in, 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 in the land of the forefathers, important to uh, continue to, uh, to witness where they are. They are fa facing difficulties, yes, everybody else is facing difficulties. Others also, other Christians and, and non-Christian Muslims also are facing difficulties. Uh, fleeing to safety may be a short-term solution, but it's not definitely not in the best interest of our people on the long run. So. I'm, uh, I'm torn apart here. I want people to be safe. I cannot uh, force them or tell them to stay no matter what because I cannot promise them, I cannot guarantee them security. But at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in pain and I'm, my heart is bleeding because I see uh, our people leaving our uh, homeland and going to uh, basically to, be, uh, to join the diaspora. Um, I, I don't know what to say except Whoever stays at home, we encourage them and they will try our best to help them. Whoever also makes it to, to, to Europe, other places, it's our obligation also to help them as much as we can. Thank you. Your Holiness, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be with you. God bless you. Our patriarch, thank you very much. Thank you. All the best for your program.
uh, your new program on Sulioya set and uh, greetings to all your uh, uh, viewers and uh, audience. Taudi Sagi, Shlomo Kulefu, Alom Matar, Kof Taudi. Shlomo Taudi. This is Daniel Gabriel speaking from The Big Picture. I'm here in beautiful Yerevan, Armenia. We're here at the Global Forum for Crime Against Genocide. Um, we've been here for a few days now, and we've seen a lot of Armenia already. Uh, let me go and ask Johnny about the Yerevan itself, right? We've been here for a few days as well. You see all the beauty around you. What do you think about the Armenians, Yerevan, Armenia? They've come from the days of genocide to, to this? Um, I think the Armenian people are a great people. Uh, the kindness they've showed us th these days is fantastic, I should say. Like, we have received and experienced a very warm reception. Uh, I think the way they uh, recovered themselves after the genocide is amazing. Yeah. Um, they have a great cultural heritage, and you see how they take care of their cultural heritage. They're very proud of it. The Armenians are a very proud uh, and patriotic people. That's something that appeals to me personally. So it feels fantastic to be here in Yerevan. Um, the Global Forum itself as well, Philip, um, you were also present for a few days. So you heard a lot of speeches from a lot of parliamentarians, a lot of scholars, historians. What are, from a legal perspective, from your perspective on legal issues, you know, you heard about, of course, the recognition of genocide. What kind of other issues kind of really hit home for you? I think uh, what we had here was a combination of both legal and s scholastic presentations. But we were focusing on the legal. We had the great Jeffrey Robertson here, who's currently uh, presenting the Armenian case before the European Court of Human Rights. And the key item which came out from this, from these legal scholars and legal minds, was reparation. So recognition, reparation. And this is something which also applies to Serioye, because we don't, we have, first of all, let's say, for example, current land issues in Turkey, but on top of this, we still haven't focused on reparation, as in what happened and what we lost in the genocide. So this has been particularly fascinating on that point, and how do we, as uh, Aramean Syriacs, approach this issue? Uh, that, that was a, a fascinating point, actually, that was raised in the conference because we've heard before that a lot of people have said, why would I go back and ask for reparations, right? I mean, I just want recognition. That's my thing. I just want recognition, right? So can I just go back to you again, Philip, on that? Because it is a fascinating thing. People say, well, uh, reparations, I just want recognition. I don't want... Why would I ask Turkey for money or land or whatever? It's... Okay, we gotta we got to kind of break this down a bit. Um, from the Armenian perspective and whether it was... Let's, let's take it back to, to the Nazis and the crimes against the Jews and what did the Jews obtain from that. Uh, following on from this, then the Armenians are following a similar suit. Okay, we have our recognition, but at the same time, we still want reparation. We still want uh, some form of compensation for our lands, for the suffering, for our churches. There were even at times where some people even mentioned uh, re drawing the re-boundaries of uh, Armenia back to what it was at the Treaty of Severus. Some things, that, that, was, that was dismissed outright, but uh, 
These are things which are provided for under international law. So why are they not doing it? It makes no sense not to do it. Um, Johnny, just uh, to go back to the Global Forum as well, you know, we heard about reparations and I heard, again, one of the, the presenter said, but why wouldn't I ask for uh, the land or money? It's mine. Someone took it from me, right? Um, what were your thoughts on that as well? I think it's a valid argument. I mean, you're not asking somebody else's property. You're asking what is yours and what has been stolen from you. So I don't... Look, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how this is legally, but I'm sure there are uh, good laws that can uh, substantiate the claims that you're uh, asking back what is yours. So that's not a um, strange thing to do, I would say. And, and one of the things they said, like, you have to uh, negotiate this with, uh, with, uh, with Turkey as a state. And during the negotiations, they said, there will be compromises that have to be made. Yeah. But in the end, you're not asking something that is not yours. You're, you're asking something that was once yours and that has been taken away from you yeah. illegally. Yeah. Can I just make a, add on to that? So the, the position now of the Armenians is trying to ask for something which has been taken by some, which is owned by, let's say, a third party. And in Vans, what happened was when the Armenians were killed, death marches, law came into place, abandoned property laws, which confiscated their properties. Then they went and got uh, Turkish, they were displaced from the Balkans and put them in Vance. But in our situation, we still have our land. Most, we still have a great portion of it, it's still with us. And that is being taken from us right here and now. Not, by, not given to a third party, but by the state. And, and in fact, uh, we're, we're facing those issues with Turkey today, of course. Like, look, uh, we have two things here. Uh, Turkey was founded in 1923. Before 1923, during the Ottoman Empire, they had what they call kochanat, the title deeds, right? And they call them today, after 23, they call them tapo. So we have a lot of Arameans, they come to us and they give us literally, not just their tapos from today, but I have received, and you have received them, Philip has received them, like huge uh, documents and files that go back like 80, 100 years ago and they call them kochanat from the Ottoman Empire. Um, and these uh, documents, testified to the fact that the Arameans once had huge amounts of lands and they come from areas like Diyarbakir, Mardin, the Midyad region and all this is legally still ours if you look at it and that's what we are trying to struggle for. Uh, we're trying to s struggle for um, first of all keeping what we have today and secondly we try to get back what was once ours and what is legally still ours if you look at it from that perspective. Can I, uh, can I ask you as well Philip about uh, during the conference, of course, y you also met with a lot of parliamentarians, a lot of historians, yeah. scholars as well. What were your general thoughts about the, about the conference itself? Uh, what did you get out of it? I think the conference was very enlightening, right? First thing was that there's so much emphasis they put on the genocide here in Armenia. Whereas uh, we, uh, the Armenian Syriacs, we don't put this much of an emphasis as they have put on it themselves. That's the first point. The second point is, and again, being a lawyer myself, from, from a legal perspective, what did I get from this, right? Is that we haven't, we, ha we haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't categor categorized what the effects of the genocide have been on us from, uh, from, a, from a legal point of view. Wh did what happened to us amount to genocide? And if it didn't amount to genocide, what are your arguments? Okay, legally, this is, this is what happened. Facts are this. We apply the law. This is what the law says about genocide. And from that law, this is what you're entitled to claim. We haven't done this. We haven't established the facts to the extent which the Armenians have. They've got volumes after, vo I mean, you can ask Johnny, volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes on genocide of what's happened to them. What do we have? What do we have establishing our facts? And we can't go to any court. We can't go to any forum without facts. And this was a brilliant point when I was at the conference raised by the uh, president of the Constitutional Court, the Armenian Constitutional Court, the judge, his honor. His honor pointed out, he said, look, there's been a lot of scholars here today. <laughs> and the scholars have been saying a lot of things, right? But there's a lot of gaps in what they've been saying. And we need to fill up those gaps legally because only legally can we do something. We can, we can sc scholarly debate till the, till the sky falls on us. Uh, well, let me, let me just uh, talk about that for a moment because one of the things we know is that 
with uh, recognition was number one issue here. So even from a legal perspective, they're trying, the Armenians have been trying their best to push uh, different parliaments and governments around the world to recognize the genocide. So let's move away from the reparation issues and the other legal issues. Let's talk about recognition. What are your thoughts about recognition today? Because we just saw Austria recognize a few days ago. You saw Russia recognize again with Putin. You've seen Germany debate it in the parliament just yesterday as well. What are your thoughts about recognition? I think it's fascinating what's happening now. In just a matter of two weeks' time, you see one government after the other, starting with the EU, recognizing the genocide. And what's interesting for us is that they no longer speak about the Armenian genocide only. They also include the Armenian and the Greek Christians uh, that also were uh, suffering from the same genocide. Um, what I found interesting here is, for example, is this is a discussion, a debate in the Armenian community and also triggered or encouraged by the government itself is that they're trying to move on, as Philip also pointed out, they're trying to move from the stage of recognition to the legal aspect of reparations and uh, what can we uh, get back from the damages and the losses we have uh, that have been inflicted upon us. Well, what we heard as well, right, was this discussion. A couple, of the, a couple of the guys that presented actually said, look, for us, recognition, that's, that's done. That's done. This, this genocide actually took place, right? So let's move on from that and move to other issues now and try to get back what's ours. That was actually an Armenian lawyer from America. <laughs> and he's actually part of a task force here in Armenia. And part of that task force is to determine they're trying to work out exactly what the laws are internationally, what forum, where they can take their arguments to, and what they can claim. So it's quite right like what Johnny and you have just mentioned. They've, they, they've gone past, as far as they're concerned, where recognition, we've crossed that box, done. Now let's move on to reparation, and what are we going to do about that in terms of a claim, a claim, a claim in court, claiming whether it be money or property, one or the other. There's no other, there's no other way about it. Johnny, let me, let me just talk to you for a moment about this, uh, the recognition issue because, and you, you mentioned it here about the recognition of the, uh, not only the Armenians, but also the, the Greeks and what the Armenians term the Asuri people as well. What are your thoughts about this? Because during the two days of, the three days of the conference, basically we heard a lot of this terminology of Assyrian or Asuri constantly, right? What do you have to say about that? I think it's a matter of, <coughs> uh, first of all, a mistranslation of Azuri, uh, the Armenian term uh, with reference to our people, which should be translated as Syrian or Syriac. Uh, secondly, it's a misrepresentation of our identity, because we are no Assyrians, uh, as most of the scholars who are experts in uh, our history, language, and uh, identity uh, would confirm. Uh, thirdly, <coughs> it's not just a misrepresentation or distortion of our history and identity uh, or uh, uh, or you can say like a half portrayal of our identity we're talking here about also the denial of our very identity you're talking here about the denial of the Aramean identity the Aramaic language um, by the way we're here just for the people to know we're here on uh, what they call Aram Street uh, very interestingly of course that's why we started here um, it's a beautiful street down downtown uh, Yerevan, and we'll be heading down to the Republic uh, shortly and over to the memorial site as well. Um, and as we're passing by, Matei, do you want to just take a few shots of the of these stones, these magnificent stones um, that we see everywhere? Uh, Johnny, can, you s can I just talk to you about these stones as well? Um, you see a lot of these beautiful stones here some of them dating back to 1556 and other times. You know, if we, if we had our own country, one would actually say that we would have a lot of these stones everywhere as well, probably, of course, dating back way before then. Uh, yes, uh, the, these stones are from the Christian period. Um, you ho they also have stones, these vertical, uh, vertical uh, columns, as they call them. <coughs> they also go back to pre-Christian times because the art and the architectural, uh, architectural uh, heritage of the Armenians goes back way before Christianity. So uh, yes, if we would have our own country, we would have like hundreds and thousands of such kind of cultural artifacts. Uh, let me also 
Mate, what about this one over here? This uh, this stone here looks absolutely magnificent, doesn't it? Um, Philip, I mean, you you're looking at a at just uh, you you're seeing some amazing uh, uh, not only the architecture of Yerevan but also these incredible stones. What are your thoughts? No, I I, I was overwhelmed, right? Because this is something which I've never seen before, and it. It's inspirational when you see this, because where could we have been if we had all this? And just looking at the the, arch the preservation of the architecture, if you look through the street, if you look through the site, just if you, can you put a camera shot on that, on on the on the on those on the pictures over there? So what they've got pictures there is. Let's, let's walk towards the pictures. If you have a look at all those pictures. Let's walk towards the pictures, as well. Go and look at those pictures. So they've gone and taken pictures of what they had churches and buildings in Turkey before they were bombed and destroyed by the Ottomans. So you have picture before and picture after. Uh, yes. Picture before, picture after. And this, this shows their, 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 their connection with their culture and their identity and how they're willing to keep on showing it wherever you go, wherever you go. It's not just that. You see also like how vibrant the Aramean national identity, their national history, their national cultural heritage still is. It still has meaning for them. And what's most important, these stones, you just said like you have never seen them, right? If you go to Turkey, you see them. You know where you can find them? In the museum. You can find them in the museum, but here you can see it's, it's still alive, you know? And this shows the fidelity of the Armenian cultural heritage. And if we would have our own country, you would have seen such things as well, like both in the museum, but especially also in parks, in, on the streets, like everywhere throughout the country to to confirm the antiquity of your own identity and the connection with your past, your ancient past. Uh, because and one of the things, uh, Mate, let's let's take a walk back towards here. Um, one of the things that they that we also saw, of course, were all these references to not only the Armenians uh, holding on to their spiritual faith, but also holding on to their nationalism which I think is uh, something which is very dear to your heart. It, it is, it is. Like, if you l listen to the speeches, not just of the president, because you expect it from a secular uh, um, ruler, right? Yeah. But if you listen to the speeches of the Catholicoi, the two uh, Catholicoi patriarchs, the one of all the Armenians and the other one of Kalikia, both of them stress that the Armenians, and the same is actually true for the Greeks and the Arameans, they were killed for their faith and for their homeland. They were killed for their Christian, their religious, and their ethnic identity. And these two points are intertwined, these two dimensions of the identity. And the same applies to our people, actually, and that's fascinating. Uh, in, in my view, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, well, down, down towards here, Mate, is the, uh, is the market that uh, this is, of course, um, Saturday in Yerevan, there's also a, a strip of shopping mall down over there, but we're not going to head down that in that area. I think the market is also way too busy uh, for us, but we're going to head to the next place and we'll continue the conversation. Um, this is uh, just a glimpse of, of Yerevan, Armenia. We're going go to go on and on and on. Uh, back in a moment. So we just came back from Aram Street and we're here in the Republic Square. You'll notice the absolute beauty of the square as well. For those who may be in the know, this is where uh, Kanye West, I think, had his concert here just last week. System of a Down had their concert here, in fact, just a couple of days ago to commemorate the genocide, uh, April 24 date. Um, and you also see behind us the History Museum uh, of Armenia, uh, which is there as well. So it's an absolutely beautiful area here. Uh, back again with Johnny Meso and Philip Hanna. Uh, Johnny, uh, let me ask you in this in this beautiful area here. Um, I want to talk about the connection between the Aramean Syriacs and the Armenians, because the Armenians uh, they say that their church was founded in 301. Uh, AD, and they talk about the the great history of their of their church. But there's also uh, other connections that we have uh, linguistically with the Armenians, and also 
historically. Do you want to elaborate on that? Let me first say a word about the difference between the Armenians and the Aramean Christians. Um, the Armenians are an Indo-European people, their language is Indo-European, and the Aramean people, and the Aramaic language on the uh, other hand, belong to the Semitic family. Having said that, if you look at the similarities, uh, things we have in common, the Armenians and the Arameans, um, both lived approximately in the same region. The Armenians lived north, of, north from us, and we lived, say, in Syria, in Lebanon, and in southeast Turkey. Um, one of the similarities is that the Ar Armenians adopted Christianity in, say, 301, and, and we are close to each other when it comes to Christology, the theology, we belong both to the Oriental Orthodox churches. Uh, that's also a reason why the Syriac Orthodox Patriarch was invited uh, these last days to attend and uh, participate in the events, in the Global Forum, and also in the cer ceremonies. Um, the second thing is that the Aramean Christians, we adopted Christianity, say, in the first century already. Uh, in, in Syria, in Antioch, for example, where the, where the followers of Jesus, as the Bible says, were called Christians for the first time. And Antioch was the capital of Roman Syria in, this, in that period, but now it is part of Turkey, Antakya it's called today. Now, from Syria, the Armenian Christians and the Jewish Christians, the early Christians one can say, um, spread Christianity north. So they went from Jerusalem, they went to um, uh, Antioch and Syria, they went to other places like Lebanon and Mesopotamia, in southeast Turkey where we live, in, in a place called Edessa. Um, from there, the Aramean Christians, they went up north and they brought Christianity actually to Armenia. And this is well recorded in early Ar Armenian literature that the Aramean Christians um, helped spread Christianity among the Armenians. And one of, or I should say there are a few interesting facts here, Daniel. One of the interesting facts is that if you look at the early Armenian litur liturgy, and still Armenian liturgy today contains quite some Aramaic words. And this is fascinating. And another thing is, that there is this uh, monk called Daniel Azori. They know very well the Armenians, especially in early Armenian literature. He was the one who originally helped develop or even maybe developed the current Armenian script. So, th because the Armenians, they didn't have a script of their own in 301. And but, but can I say that you've looked at the script. I it doesn't look anything like anything I've ever seen before, right? I agree. I mean, I read different Aramaic scripts, but I can't de decode or decipher the Armenian <laughs> script today. Um, because I don't read Armenian. You spoke to, uh, of course, President Putin of, of the Russian Federation, um, and you met with a lot of other politicians as well. Do you just want to talk about the, the huge benefit of events like this, being able to meet politicians and discuss issues of huge concerns for our people? Yeah, first of all, I'm incredibly indebted to the Armenian government for extending uh, the invitation to the World Council of Armenian Syriacs. I mean, we had a distinguished honor and pleasure to meet so many uh, politicians and scholars uh, from various countries in the world and we communicated with them about our plight because we told them like we feel that our genocide is underrepresented and it is underrepresented. It means so much to you because you've obviously had some personal impact and I think the thing is is that everyone at home has also had some type of personal impact. I mean you know that my great-grandfather on my mother's side was burnt alive during the Seifor, his two brothers were also burnt alive. My grandmother, uh, my grandmother was also stolen when she was just a young girl, and they had to go back and retrieve her with her sister. Uh, you know, we all have these personal stories, right? Why is it important for people, from your perspective, to remember the genocide and demand recognition, demand potential reparations, to make demands on the people or the country? that committed this heinous crime against humanity? The symbol of it is, right, Daniel, it's a basic human right, isn't it? This is a basic human right which you're entitled to request, which came out from what we see as being a civilized world. In an uncivilized world, which is what I presume the historians and scholars, what they called it, is killing at random, killing impunity, killing and doing whatever you want, right? But this is a civilized world. And in civilized world, we have law, we have codes, we have systems. And coming off the back of that, if you commit a crime, there's a consequence. Genocide is a crime. Genocide is a crime. 
And there's a consequence to that. Now, you can't, this is why, for example, that we need to pay attention to Hi, it's Daniel Gabriel again here where, as you can see behind us, we see the mo magnificent Mount Ararat. Uh, we were here actually yesterday at the memorial uh, where we also met, of course, uh, the president of Armenia. Uh, we met Holland, of course, and we also met uh, Putin. Um, we were here for the incredible, incredible ceremony uh, which took place to commemorate the 100 years of the genocide of the Armenians, the Greeks, and the Aramean Syriacs. Um, Johnny, let's walk towards the memorial site again. Let's go have another look at it. Uh, let me just ask you, as we're walking here, um, a lot of people, of course, visiting the site today, as they were yesterday, was <laughs> it felt like hundreds of thousands of people were here yesterday as well, right? Um, how did you feel about the, the whole event uh, as well? Because you see a magnificent memorial you, you, we, we experienced an incredible ceremony. How did you feel about it? It's indescribable. I mean, you see so many people. Yesterday it was also packed, and today it's crowded. You see that the genocide that took place 100 years ago is still of critical importance to the people today. And uh, the eternal fire where we are going to, it has memorialized what, ha what has happened 100 years ago, and everybody is still close, closely, personally attached to it. So it's it's an amazing feeling. I mean that you can be part of this 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 whole honor you're paying to the victims of 100 years ago. And most of these victims, they have no name. They have been forgotten by history. And by having such a symbol on top of a mountain, yeah, Mount Ararat, of course, is of world of world importance. To have such a m memorial on a mountain with such an amazing and beautiful view, it's it's a symbol of their presence. Their your persistence as a people, as an, as an Armenian nation, to say to the world, like, look, we are still here. Regardless of an attempt to eradicate us, to exterminate our people, we are still here. And this symbol shows also to the world that they ask for recognition. They ask the world for support. And I think it's of it's, uh, critical importance. Uh, we, we're obviously also looking at having memorial sites uh, around the world. And um, are we, we're nowhere near this level. Of course, we don't have our own country. To, to have a one central memorial in one, in one place. But are we also doing the same thing? Sort of. Um, we're trying to set up or erect monuments. Uh, we have a site for a genocide monument coming up on the 10th of May in Brussels, which we try to uh, set up in Brussels in order to raise more awareness about the fact that there was not just an, an Armenian genocide, but also a genocide against the Aramean population, just as much as there was a genocide against the Greek people. So a monument helps to increase awareness about this sensitive subject, but it also helps to, um, to, to, to strengthen the identity of the Aramean people, that they, are, that they will not forget the, the losses they have suffered, they, they will not forget the honorable martyrs of our people. Uh, Philip, let me ask you, because you were here yesterday as well for the, uh, for the actual event, um, how did you feel during the event itself, because it was, we just experienced at the coronation, the 100 bells, 7.15 p.m. silence, just the, the incredible feeling that you, we, we had there, the doves that were released by the children. Uh, you could go on and on and on at that event. How was your experience here? I think, uh, I, uh, it's hard to describe it, was, right, because I've never felt this before. I've never felt this kind of uh, emotional outflow and out emotional showing of uh, the genocides. We had genocides too, right? But we certainly don't have any monuments. We don't have so any... Like, th like mm -hmm. this, of certainly course. Certainly nothing like this. like this. Certainly nothing like this. We don't have commemorations like this. We don't have any of this. So for me, coming and seeing this, and seeing the monuments and seeing just the high level of delegations from around the world attending and recognizing the, the genocides. It was very, very, very powerful, very powerful. And, and it, it left a, like a, an imprint on me. It's left an imprint on me in t terms of now that I, I, I look more towards now my, my, my safe or our genocide and what happened to us and how we should also be 
cherishing and recognizing and acknowledging and promoting and letting people know that we had a say so too. There was our genocide too. We suffered too. And um, no, it's just absolutely incredible. It's lovely to be lovely to be here. Um, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of people going ab around us and stuff um, as we're walking towards this. Um, Johnny, why don't I, I talk to you as we're walking towards the memorial about the back to the uh, back to the forum, and we talk a little bit about some of the key points that you raised because during the forum you also uh, gave a speech there, a very moving speech, and there were quite a few people that actually responded to that speech as well, right? Uh, what, were the, what were the key messages that you raised during that speech? Uh, first of all, that um, the genocide that occurred in 1915 didn't occur just in 1915. It happened before, during, and after 1915. And moreover, the Armenians were not the only victims of this genocide, but also the Arameans and the Greeks. And for that reason, we understand and we share the pain felt by the Armenians. Uh, second point I stressed was one of the consequences of this genocide is that um, we lost not just human losses but also our cultural heritage. I mean how many libraries were burned, how many ancient churches and monasteries were destroyed. I mean it impacted um, our people just as much as it impacted the Armenians and the Greeks. And on top of that um, we also see that as a consequence, as a result of the uh, Armenian genocide, or the Greek genocide, or the Aramean genocide, the people also ended up in a worldwide diaspora. They, they fled their homeland, right? But a third point, and this is was the point I tried to bring home, was in contradistinction to the Armenians and the Greeks, for example, is that the Aramean people, um, they were left without a homeland of their own. The Armenians and the Greeks, they have their own homeland, the Arameans, they don't have a state of their own today. And why it is important is that they don't have a state or government or country of their own is because the genocide that happened, as I said bef before, during and after 1915, uh, continued until the present day among our people. We have suffered in Syria in the last several years and in Iraq again. And because of that, we see that there is a continuous genocide going on for a full century. It never ended in 1915. It, it didn't begin in 1915 and it didn't end in 1915 for our people and it continues today. And there's no government or a country in the world that supports us to protect our cultural heritage in the first place, uh, our churches, our monasteries, but also our identity, our language, our very language, for example. There's nobody who protects it, who safeguards our identity uh, and n there's also nobody who can protect us physically. We are being persecuted, we are being kicked out of our homes, etc. That's why we are in need of the support of the global community, but especially of the support of the Armenian and the Greek governments. This, these were the three points I made uh, in, 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 in a summarily way at this conference. And I, I think uh, some of the other people that were there really uh, took to that message, didn't they? Because and I think we have to go this way, Matei, as well, actually. Um, some of them really thought that that was an incredible message because no one had really thought of the distinction between the uh, Armenians, the Greeks, and the Aramean Syriacs, right? Um, and then one of the other things that you raised as well was that the SAFOR continues today, correct? So do you want to just elaborate a little bit more on on the SAFOR that exists today and what, how that message was carried forward in the in the conference, in the forum? Like, look, if you look at Turkey, for example, in the first place, we have a small population left in southeast Turkey. There's only 3,000 Arameans left, maximum. Their future is very uncertain. If it continues like today, if we don't see any changes uh, anytime soon, it means that in 30, 40 years from now, there will be no Arameans left in, in the region. One of the major problems we face in southeast Turkey is the confiscation of our land. The confiscation of our land and properties still continues at this very moment as we speak. That's what I stress at the conference. It's a form of genocide as well. It, it means that we don't want you here. That's the message. Like The message is there is no future for your people in this country, in your own homeland. The second point is when you look at Iraq, for example, in Iraq where the Christians were reduced from a population to from 1.4 million 
to a few hundred thousand recently. And when ISIS took over Mosul, 160,000 Arameans at least were expelled out of their homes. And they are living now in refuge, and not just in Iraq, in the Kurdish region, but also in the surrounding countries. And some of them were killed. Most of them, they are scattered uh, across the Middle Eastern region. And if you look in Syria, if you look at Syria, in Syria you find exactly the same si situation. Also, a huge re re um, diminishment. The, the Christians have been dwindling, uh, dwindling there in Syria, and of the I don't know how many, they were 10% just until a few years ago, until 2011. But now I'm, I'm not sure whether there is even like 3% left of the Christians in Syria. So the, the challenges we face as a people in comparison to other nations, whether the Muslims who are suffering in the Middle East or to the Armenians and the Greeks who also suffered from the ancient genocide and the Armenians who suffered, for example, in, in, in Syria and Kitab, is that the, the Armenian Christians are facing an existential threat. And this is very important. I said the, anni the annihilation is almost complete. We are almost, uh, we are almost gone from this planet. We are, we are disappearing. And that's what SIFO means to us. It's an ongoing SIFO. It never ended it, and it's still continuing today. Johnny raised the point, right, about the lands in Turkey. Uh, the CUP, uh, and Johnny may know this, CUP, the, the the Turkish government back when the genocides were occurring. One of their policies was to have no more than 5 to 10 percent uh, Armenians, Greeks or Arameans in each particular city or town. Uh, following on the back of that, once they started the mass deportations, and you know this too, Daniel, is yeah. that they brought in the uh, uh, abandoned property laws. Yeah. So the people, they knew the people weren't coming back right? They bring in the law, confiscate all the properties. And Johnny raised the point, uh, his first point being that this ongoing, this, uh, let's call it extermination, extermination of the existence of our people. Now there's certain things happening in uh, Turkey today, right now, which, uh, which are quite worrying. For me they're worrying because you have certain I don't know whether it's just, I don't know whether it's coming from top level government or wherever it's coming from, but it's now relying on laws, old laws to non new laws, old laws and with new laws coming in, which is, with which we are seeing land being confiscated and not just one hectare, two hectares, massive swathes of land being called forestry and being called treasury land. Very, very similar, maybe not, not using the same names as the abandoned property acts back when the genocide was happening, but the effect is exactly the same. The effect is the same. I don't know, I, I will not question the intention, because I don't know what the intention, but the effect, if you're looking at it, eradicating, exterminating, eliminating, then you have that. That's what's going to happen. I just think that's um, something we just, uh, yeah, just a point to raise. That's all. Well, as you can see, uh, Mate is, is having a, a look over all the people that are here today. Um, for the memorial and I think what we'll do is we'll just stay around over here Johnny because I think it's impossible for us to actually get down into there but Mate do you just want to take a shot of the memorial site here because you can see that the just the amount of people here is incredible um, of course we were here yesterday during the official ceremony just an incredible, incredible experience. Uh, people here to pay homage to, of course, their fallen, their, those that have died here um, at the hands of the Ottoman Empire. And as we are also here uh, to commemorate those of our own Aramean Syriacs that were also killed during the genocide. So, Philip, we're here actually just in, in front of the memorial site. And do you just want to let the viewers know what is the significance? What's the meaning of that amazing the structure there? The 
monument actually has a, has a beautiful meaning. Now, if you have a look at it, you see that it's divided into two. So you have one, two, and there's a space in between. And as it goes up, it joins into one. Now, one side represents East Armenia, and the other side represents West. And their hope and prayers are that one day, the two will unite and become one. This is the meaning of their monument. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's incredible. Okay, so... Um and again, you can see all the people that are rushing towards that. Uh, Johnny, one last message for, for our Armenian Syriac viewers all over the world. If you look at the Armenians here, they wear T-shirts like we never forget, or our wounds are still, still open. And if you see how they uh, pay uh, honor to their victims, I think we can learn much from that. And we are doing that, m many of us. But what we have to do is to educate the new generation that, they, that we should really never forget. We should try to learn what happened, why things happened as they have, ha have happened and occurred. And most importantly, as the president of Armenia stressed a few times, is um, we have to remember and demand. And that's what we have to do. We have to remember what happened, but also demand our rights, and especially fight for the future survival of our people. Because that's the real genocide that's taking place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Philip. Thank you very much to Johnny for, work, for being on the program with me. Um, let me just say to, uh, to all the viewers, as Johnny and Philip go towards towards the uh, monument. Um, it's been an amazing experience. Come with me, Mate. Um, it's been an amazing experience here um, in Armenia, uh, in Yerevan. I'm telling you, I thought I had an emotional connection to say for, um, but it's been nothing compared to what, I've, what I now feel. Um, just being here amongst all of the Armenians that are so, that just remember what took place here, that hold on to it, that won't let it go, that, as Johnny had said, make demands. They remember and they demand. And that's what our people need to also do. I encourage everyone, all proud Aramean Syriacs all over the world, to ask your parents. Your parents, I ask you to please speak to your children. Tell them what took place during the Seifel. Tell them what took place even during the 50s and the 60s when a lot of our people had to escape and head to Europe and head to America, head to Australia. Those are important facts to also remember. And I'm telling you, um, Armenia has been uh, uh, an incredible experience for me uh, because the Armenian people have come from almost nothing and they've risen up to this. And they are an inspiration to me, and they will probably be an inspiration to you. So, signing off from Yerevan, Armenia, Daniel Gabriel, thanks for watching. Till next time.